Welcome to this webinar series, which is all about the recently published UK guidelines for HIV PEP published in 2021. I'm Dr. Krisha Patel, and I'm a sexual offences examiner working in sexual assault referral centres. When deciding whether to offer HIV PEP, we need to first decide whether the person is eligible for PEP. As mentioned in the first episode, PEP must be offered in the 72 hour window of opportunity. Therefore, we must, to the best of the patient's knowledge, document the time or the time frame of the exposure, whether that is a needle stick exposure, a sexual exposure such as unprotected sexual intercourse, or a sexual assault. We also need to know the past medical history for example, if they have any liver or renal impairment, whether they could be pregnant, so always do a pregnancy test in women of childbearing age, just to check, and the mental health history may be relevant as well. And we need to check the drugs and allergies because there are many medications that interact with antiretroviral therapy and these must be checked. BASH guidelines recommend using HIV drugs interactions checker and I'll add a link to that in the description box below. We then need to do a risk assessment or do some sort of risk benefit analysis to help us decide whether it is worthwhile to offer PEP. I'd like you to pause this video and write down or if you're working in small groups discuss this amongst yourself what factors affect the risk of HIV transmission? So again, that's what factors affect the risk of HIV transmission? Pause the video and write down or discuss your answers in small groups. So some of the things you may have put down include the type of exposure, for example, anal sex or a human bite, the risk of transmission of HIV during anal sex is greater than during vaginal sex, which is greater than during oral sex. So the type of exposure is important to know. The number of exposures. So are we considering PEP in the context of a gang rape sexual assault incident or a chemsex party where there may have been multiple incidents of sexual exposures? Or was it a single episode of unprotected sexual intercourse with a known partner? The risk of HIV in the index partner. So are they known to have HIV already? Are they taking any treatment for it? Or if the index partner is in one of the certain groups which have higher risk of having HIV, that's important to know. Within the UK, the higher risk groups are likely to be men who have sex with men and IV drug users and individuals who have immigrated to the UK from areas of high HIV prevalence, particularly sub-Saharan Africa. The susceptibility of the recipient, for example, does the recipient have genital ulcer disease, which may make it easier for the virus to cross the broken mucosal barrier into the body tissues and into the blood where it can replicate. Have there been any aggravating factors such as anal genital injuries or trauma? Again, because if there is trauma or anal genital injuries present, there may be a breached mucosal barrier and that might make it easier for the virus to cross that barrier into the blood where it can replicate. And anogenital injuries can occur through consensual sex as well as non-consensual sex or sexual assault and can also occur during first intercourse. So that's something to look for and ask the patient about. So being circumcised reduces the risk of HIV transmission. So if ejaculation has occurred, the risk is increased and there may be other factors to consider as well. To decide whether to offer someone PEP, we need to do a risk assessment. 
and we need to think about the risk of HIV transmission. The risk of HIV transmission is equal to the risk that the source is HIV positive with a detectable HIV viral load multiplied by the risk per exposure. So let's break up this equation. So if the source is definitely HIV positive and not taking any treatment, then that part of the equation here would be one. The part about the detectable viral load here is important as many people in the UK know they have HIV and are on effective treatment which gives them an undetectable HIV viral load. And in these cases when there is an undetectable HIV viral load on their recent blood tests, the risk of transmission of HIV is very low and PEP is not recommended in these cases. Now let's think about the risk per exposure here. So when we're thinking about the risk per exposure, we need to think about what the exposure was. Was it receptive anal intercourse with ejaculation? Or was it receptive vaginal sex, etc.? These estimates are based on cohort studies and modeling studies. In practice, we will not have all the information to be able to accurately calculate the risk of HIV transmission. But we need a basic understanding of the equation above to have some idea of what the risk of transmission is to help us decide whether it's in the benefit of the patient to have PEP. So thankfully, the HIV PEP guidelines have published tables with up-to-date prevalence data for different population groups. So this table tells us the number and prevalence of people with detectable and transmissible levels of HIV per 1,000 population of adult age group 15 to 74 in England in 2018. And it gives us the prevalence data for different population groups, such as gay and bisexual men living in London, or the risk in heterosexual women who are non-Black African living in England. And the BASH guidelines have also published tables that allow us to estimate the risk of transmission from a particular exposure. So this table shows the risk of HIV transmission per exposure from a known HIV positive individual not on suppressive antiretroviral therapies and therefore assumed to have a detectable viral load which means HIV is transmissible. So if the source is known to have HIV and receptive anal intercourse occurs then the risk is one in 90. If ejaculation has occurred, the risk is one in 65, so the risk is higher. And if no ejaculation occurred, it's one in 170. The risk from a needle stick injury, if the other person is known to have HIV, is one in 333. In the next session, we'll go over a scenario to help you estimate the risk of HIV transmission using the formula mentioned before. Thank you for listening and if you found this session useful then please check out the rest of the series and don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel.